All right, let's uh, go ahead and start with uh, Rome, uh, Hermeneutics chapter 7 or lesson 7. The, we're going to talk about interpreting narratives. This is easier, easier than doing the uh, epistles. Epistles, I think, is the hardest in terms of outlining. Uh, but uh, and, and maybe we'll be able to see that as we go. But let's have a word of prayer. We'll get started. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for the word of God that makes us uh, knowledgeable of the things that you would have us to do and to be. And as we study how to interpret your word, may we interpret it wisely. May your Holy Spirit touch our hearts. May your Holy Spirit open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things from your law. May we rejoice together in the word of God that has been given by holy men of old as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So we thank you for it. Keep us uh, alert. Help us, Father, to concentrate and help us, Father, to learn all for your glory and honor. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The interpretive task, narratives, and of course we recognize the PowerPoint there as David is cutting off the head of Goliath while the Israeli army evidently on the right there is now getting souped up to go fight against the Philistines there. Remember they were afraid of him at first, but then once David killed Goliath, they were loaded for bear and went after the Philistines and smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter. Actually, that was, who was the one who did that? That was uh, Samson. He smote the Philistines hip and thigh, I think it says, uh, with a great slaughter. But anyway, narratives are stories. The fall, Noah's Ark, the Exodus, the book of Ruth, David and Goliath, the birth accounts of Jesus, the book of Acts, you know, stories of, of Jesus walking on the water, and all those sorts of things. Those are all narratives. Over 40% of the Old Testament and nearly 60% of the New Testament is narrative. So narrative is the most common literary form in the Bible. More narrative than anything else. Not combined. Uh, of course, it only makes up, you know, it makes up 60% of the New Testament. Well, I guess it does. It, it makes it, uh, if it makes up 40%, well, no, 60% of the New Testament is quite a bit shorter than the Old Testament. But probably close to 50% than total of the Bible. Maybe not quite that much, but uh, there's a lot. 60% of the New Testament, because you figure the Gospels and Acts, that makes up a big chunk of the New Testament. And 40% of the Old Testament, you've got Genesis through you know, Exodus, all the historical books. Plus there's narrative in some of the prophets. Anyway, beginning with the 17th century and the Enlightenment, the supernatural and the possibility of miracles came under attack. If miracles were impossible, then they were unhistorical. That is to say, they didn't occur. Axe heads don't float, the sun doesn't stand still, donkeys don't talk, uh, people don't rise from the dead, people don't have demons cast out of them, and so on and so forth. However, if we deny the historical and factual validity of a narrative subject matter, where do we find the meaning? Moreover, where do we find its significance? Before the Enlightenment events in, before the Enlightenment events in Scripture were considered factual. Thus, meaning was found in what the author willed to convey by the information recorded. But if the events recorded didn't happen, how could the text have significance? How could it be applicable to us? In other words, once we deny the historicity of a text, the meaning and significance must be found in some place else other than what the, conscious, the author consciously willed. Three attempts were made. Once you begin to... <clears throat> Once you begin to deny that the miracles actually happened in these narratives, then you have to go somewhere else to find meaning. Well, one of the, meaning, one of the ways was rationalism. Uh, rationalists began to, to teach back in, the, back in the Enlightenment that the authors in their ignorance thought that a miracle took place, but it really didn't take place at all. They were mistaken. The story then would be demiraculized. They would take the miracle out of it and then try to figure out what was really going on. And the story would be reconstructed to find out what really occurred. For example, Jesus didn't really walk on the water. No, the disciples were simply closer to the shore than they realized, and Jesus was standing on the shore. Here, then, is where the meaning and the significance are found. Jesus was merely standing on, well, probably wet land, but it was still solid ground instead of the water. There's problems with that. First of all, that strips the story of meaning and significance. You don't find meaning and significance, you take it away. If Jesus walked on the water, then what does that tell us? He has supernatural power. He establishes his claim to be the Son of God and to be the Christ. Thus, we can trust his word and trust him in our trials because anyone who can conquer the elements can help me whenever I have a difficulty, right? Anybody who can stand up on a boat 
and tell the storm to be hushed and immediately things quiet down, then certainly he can help me if I'm in the hospital. Certainly he can see me through a time of despair. Certainly he can give me hope in the midst of grief and help in temptation. But if Jesus didn't walk on the water, now what? What importance can be found in this story if Jesus was just a man walking on the shore? Many of those who wanted to do to demac the that's a hard word to demiraculize scripture were pastors and theologians. So imagine you're standing in front of your flock and you're preaching about Jesus walking on the water, which of course we know in our enlightened age Jesus didn't really walk on the water, they just thought he did. Well, what are you going to preach on? Jesus was walking along shore one day. And I do that occasionally. How could you preach on that? What would your parishioners say? Well, gee, Pastor, thank you for that sermon showing us how ordinary Jesus was. Now I know I can find no help in him and I am lost and have no salvation. That's all you got left. You've got a man walking on shore. Big deal. So rationalism undercuts any application for us. The second view was rationalism. I should have given you this PowerPoint. The second one is accommodation, excuse me. The second one's accommodation. This is PowerPoint number two. Here the biblical writers knew what they recorded was false. They didn't believe those miracles any more than the Enlightenment people did. But since they knew their audience believed in miracles, the authors used miracle stories to teach spiritual truths. Those who believe in accommodation do believe meaning is to be found in what the author willed. However, the author falsified miracle stories to accommodate the ignorant masses. We know that their miracle took place, but those saps believe in miracles, so we'll show them through these fake stories that Jesus is the Christ. And the people who are, that believe this, they were saying that the people who wrote these false stories, they believed Jesus was the Christ too, so they made up these stories to convince others that Jesus was the Christ. The first problem with that is what? It's blatantly dishonest. It's a lie. You're making up stories and telling people that they're true so that they'll believe something you want them to believe. The second problem is there's, nowhere, there's no evidence anywhere that the authors didn't believe that what they wrote was factual. What basis do you have that these guys didn't believe these stories? You must first come to the text with a presupposition. Miracles don't happen. Now we have to explain what's going on in the text then in some other way. Well, the guys must have made these stories up, but there's no evidence that they made them up. You, only ha you can only assume that based upon your presupposition that miracles can't happen. Third, Jesus' miracles were the means by which he authenticated his message that he was the Christ. If he didn't really perform the miracles, then how do we know he's the Christ? Jesus didn't perform any miracles, but we know he's the Christ. And the only way these people are going to believe that he's the Christ is if we tell them that he performed miracles, and then they'll believe it too. The problem is, is the miracles were intended to prove that he was the Christ. And if you came to the conclusion that Jesus was the Christ without the miracles, then why can't these people come to the conclusion that Jesus is the Christ without the miracles? So why did Jesus walk on the water? Why did Jesus feed the 5,000 to show that he was the bread from heaven and that, that people could have salvation through him? But if Jesus didn't feed the 5,000, then what's the point of the story? Jesus calmed the storm to show that he had control over nature, that he's the Christ. But if he didn't calm the storm, then he's no better than me because I can't calm the storm. Thirdly, the mythical approach. Here the authors were men of integrity and truly believed that what they wrote was true. However, the miracle events didn't really happen. But were religious ideas framed in a miracle story? They're not lying here. They are merely giving a, a mythological story in order to relate a spiritual truth. These were myths that arose from the subconscious of the author. Now, I got this out of Robert Stein, who was a professor of mine at Bethel Seminary. And when he says subconscious here, I don't think he means like you're subconscious that you're doing it without being aware of it. Like when you roll over in bed at night, that you're doing that subconsciously. You don't remember it the next day, but it's obviously something that you're doing in your brain. To, you know, it's a subconscious act. But um, what it means is, is they're doing it from their own subjective understanding, I, I think is what Robert Stein means by that. 
The interpreter then must use these myths to attempt to figure out the subconscious meaning the author expressed in myth. So Jesus walked on the water. He didn't really, and we don't expect you to believe that he literally walked on the water, but we're trying to get across to you a spiritual truth. Now, two problems arise here. First of all, there's no way of ascertaining what went on in the author's subconscious. How do we know what his, if he doesn't tell us what his subjective purpose is, then what do we know why he put that story in there? How do we know that we're interpreting it properly as, you know, concerning what was going on in his head? Second, the biblical material is not written as myth. There is a big difference between myth and what we find in the scriptures. Now, I got a PowerPoint to show you that. Oh, but that PowerPoint for some reason is all messed up. Um, I can't read that myself here. I, the, the first line is cut off. Lucy, something that she had... Okay, so go ahead and read that. Chris, go ahead and read that, and somebody else can read the, the Luke account. Lucy found that she had come to the land of Narnia, where it's always winter but never Christmas. Then she met Mr. Tumnus, who was like a man from the waist up that had the legs of a goat and goat's hooves. The white witch called herself the queen of Narnia, but all the fawns and dryads and naiads and dwarfs hated her, and... She could turn people into stone, I think is the last line. Now, why that's not formatted properly because it was formatted on mine is probably just something to do with the, 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 uh, the way we've got the computer set up here. But somebody want to read uh, Luke chapter 3 for us? Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Iteria, Iteria and Trachonitis, mm -hmm. and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene, in the priesthood of Annas and Sophias, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Now, I, I gave two obvious examples here. This is PowerPoint number, PowerPoint number three. But there's two obvious, this is to just show you the contrast. You know, you've got these guys that are running around, they're, they're, they're called, you know, the, the, this guy, Mr. Tumnus, is a, a man with goat's legs and goat's hooves, and then the white witch, and fawns, and dryads, and naiads, and dwarfs, and she could, she could turn people to stone, as opposed to Luke, which gives you a very clear historical documentation. He gives us historical geographical references to what was going on in the first century. Myth doesn't do that. Um, now, historical fiction does that, but this isn't historical fiction either, because there's no indication that anyone ever meant this to be historical fiction. All right? That isn't the way it's written. The point is, that if the stories about Jesus are myth, why do you have these kinds of details in here? Why does it say, for example, on the first day of the week he rose from the dead? Or why does it say the sixth hour this happened? Or the ninth hour this happened? Why does it say that he was crucified with two thieves? And you can go all throughout Scripture. The details here, for example, uh, in, in, in uh, Luke chapter 3 that was just read for us, verses 1 and 2, you find these all over the place. For example, look, let's look at just, just one. Acts 27, verses 27 to 29. Now, again, I realize these are historical narratives, but I just want you to note some of these kinds of things. Well, we'll note another one in just a little bit here. 27, 27 to 29. But when the 14th night came, this is when they're on that ship and they're, they're, they're sailing around Greece on their way to Rome with Paul on board. But when the 14th night came, as we were being driven about in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors began to surmise that they were approaching some land. They took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And a little farther on, they took another sounding and found it to be 15 fathoms. Fearing that it might run aground somewhere in the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. If this is a myth or if this is just made up stuff, why four anchors? Now, I realize that's not a miracle story. But... Miracle stories surround all this stuff. This is part and parcel of the entire narrative. But we can go back and look at John eleven eighteen. John eleven eighteen. This is the story of where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Now notice the messages come. Lazarus has 
has, um, he's sick. Jesus waits a couple more days, and then finally he goes. And then we see in verse 11, excuse me, verse 18. We actually, go to verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he'd already been dead in the tomb four days. Why four days? Why not six days? Why not two days? Some conjecture it's because in Jewish, the Jewish way of thinking, when a person died, their spirit still hung around their body in the tomb for three days, but on the fourth day it departed. So this would be a clear indication that nobody could say, using Jewish thought, that, well, the spirit was still there and came back in on its own. I don't know, but look at verse uh, 18. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. If it's a myth, who cares how many miles it was? You find this stuff over and over and over in Scripture. It's little incidental details that give reality to the story, unlike what you have here. It does not say she met Mr. Tumnus in New York City on Times Square on you know, January 1st during the big party of, of, of New Year's Eve or whatever. It doesn't say anything like that because it's not historical. It's not meant to be taken as historical. It's a mythical land with mythical people that didn't really exist. The point should be made that once the rationalists, the accommodationists, and the mythicists denied the actual historical facticity of the biblical narratives, they lost all grounds for finding meaning in the text. By denying the truthfulness of the subject matter, the meaning and significance are lost. What's the point of Jesus walking in the water if he didn't walk on the water? Jesus was an ordinary man. As these three alternatives show, the only logical, and in the case of the accommodation, is the only honest way to find meaning in a text is to assume the historical facticity of the events recorded. All right, let's go on. We want to look at principles for interpreting narratives. I got ahead of myself a little bit here. Principles for interpreting narratives. Narrative material is very instructive, though some more so than others. Still, it's to be viewed differently than the epistles, which are more overtly instructive. If you look at the book of Romans, for example, uh, you'll find that there's a very logical argument, a teaching methodology that's going on, and a message of teaching that is, here's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to teach you, that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world and were justified through His blood. And here's what I'm teaching you, and here's what I'm telling you. The, the, the narrative material doesn't necessarily do that. We have to infer what the author is trying to get across to us. A lecture and a play may both instruct, but the lecture is more explicit and the play more implicit in their approach. A narrative story will imply truth that we have to infer, whereas a, a, a lecture or an epistle will tell you what you're being told. This is what I want you to get out of what I'm teaching you here. In the same way, an epistle is more explicit while a narrative is more implicit. Usually the author of a narrative does not write, now I'm writing this to you because. Now there, that does happen, John 20, 30, and 31. Many other things truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believe you might have life in his name. That's at the end of the book. But you don't normally find that, okay, now I'm telling you why Jesus walked on the water because. Now I'm telling you why Jesus raised Jairus' daughter because. Now I'm telling you why Jesus healed the woman who was bent over for 18 years because. You don't find that very often in the narrative material. Several observations <clears throat> should be kept in mind while interpreting narrative literature. I should have made a PowerPoint for all this and I didn't, I'm sorry. God is the ultimate subject and actor in biblical narrative. The Bible starts with God creating the heavens and the earth and ends with Him creating a new heaven and a new earth. Looking at a narrative text, we should keep in mind that what is being relayed to us is God at work. We will see this more clearly as we go on. I hope so, anyway. Secondly, don't assume the narratives are filled with hidden meanings for me. This leads to allegorizing and fanciful interpretations. When I was a kid growing up, my pastor said, <clears throat> you know, I'm not setting any dates. I never like it when I hear a pastor say that. I don't think I've ever said that because I don't like it when pastors say that. But I think Jesus might come back in the year 2000 and here's why. Well, in John 4, 43, Jesus is in Samaria. 
and he's talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. And when, after he leads her to himself, he goes and he spends some, two days in Samaria. Samaria is a picture or a type of the world. Now, that means he was in the world for two days. Now over in 2 Peter chapter 2, chapter 3, we are told that the day of the Lord is, uh, a day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Therefore, two days is two thousand years. Jesus is coming back in year 2000. Well, that's screwed up for all kinds of reasons. First of all, <laughs> you know, first, that's a terrible allegory. I mean, it's, it, it, it's so contrived and so silly. Um, not only that, but where did he get the idea that Samaria is a, is a type of the world? You know, a sort of a foreshadowing or an illustration of the world. Uh, I don't know of that anywhere. Babylon perhaps is, but not, not Samaria. So anyway, that kind of all falls apart. But don't do that. Oh, I got this deep insight here, you know. It says Jesus had 12 disciples. Well, there's 12 hours in the day, and that means then, you know. Or, and, of course, 12 hours in, in the, the waking hours or, or whatever. And, that, and, of course, then at 12 midnight, the, some spiritual blessing is going to happen to me. That's it's not the way it works. It's not the way we should be interpreting Scripture. Assume the author is telling a straightforward story with a point. When, when, when Jesus, after, after his resurrection, remember they were fishing? Anybody remember how many fish they pulled out of the sea? 153 fish. Hmm, one God. The five stands for the four uh, Gospels and the book of Acts, which tell of the great and mighty power of Jesus. And the three refers to the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Wow, do I have deep insight. No, you don't have deep insight. Why did it give the incidental detail? The miracle of the 153 fish? Because anybody who would have been there, you mean to tell me there was 153 fish in that net? They, the people would have understood that that was intended to show that that was a miracle because it says, and the net didn't break. Those people would not have been used to that kind of an event. You mean to tell me there was 153 fish and your net didn't break? Wow, that was a miracle. See? That's why it records 153 fish. The precise number, 153. So, and didn't say, you know, like a fanciful story, and it wasn't, a mer it wasn't mermaids or something like that, you know, or it wasn't Poseidon that they pulled out of, the, which would be what you'd find in, a, in, a, in, in fiction. It was real fish by real fishermen directed by the Son of God. All right. Thirdly, narratives don't always teach directly. Morals of the story sometimes are to be supplied elsewhere propositionally. This does not mean principles and applications cannot be gained from a text. It just means narratives don't always tell you directly what is the lesson. Another way of saying this is interpret the implied by the explicit or let Scripture interpret Scripture. And there's biblical warrant for this all the time. Paul, for example, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13, don't be like those people in the Exodus who you know, rejected God's word and disobeyed and rebelled and then they were smitten down by God by plagues in the wilderness. Don't be like those people. Uh, so, in other words, we're not, we're not necessarily told why those plagues took place, but the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul is drawing the inference from those texts. Don't be like those people. Um, uh, so he's inferring an application from, from, a, from a text. Don't, don't be like those people in your circumstances. In Mark chapter 2, verses 23 to 28, this is where Jesus says, why are, why are you eating, you're doing what's illegal on the, on the Sabbath day, you're eating grain from, the, from, the, from the, uh, the, the standing wheat or the standing barley. Jesus says, didn't you read about David when he went into the temple? And he ate the showbread that's, or into the tabernacle, and he ate the showbread that was only there for the priests. That's what I'm doing. I have authority over the Sabbath, and I can do this because of my position and my authority. Now, we're not told that in the original text. We're just told that David was in an emergency. He was running from Saul. He was in fear for his life, so he went in, and he actually went in and he lied to the high priest. And he said, I'm on a mission. I didn't even have time to get provisions. Please give me something to eat. Okay, you can have the showbread. It's an emergency. You're the king, and we can make an allowance under these circumstances. And Jesus simply saying, if David can do it, certainly I can do it. And there's probably, there's probably there also, 
I'm the greater David. I'm the son of David. And if David can do it, certainly I can do it because I'm the Messiah. I'm the Christ. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Um, let's turn to Genesis. We're, we're not going to finish this lesson, I don't think, tonight. Um, I have to go over to the hospital and pick somebody up. It's a long story. Um, so I need to run over there. But let's look at Genesis 39. And we'll read this, and we're going to stop here with, uh, well, we, we might do the next one too, Matthew 15, 21 to 26. But very quickly, let's read Genesis 39, 1 to 23. Somebody want to go ahead. Matt, would you read Genesis 39, verse 1, and then we'll just work our way around. I'll take whatever verse, and then we'll go back to Matt again. Genesis 39, 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him, I'm sorry, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. And the Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw the Lord was with him, and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. And he made him overseer over his house and all that he had put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had made, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was, a, was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not <clears throat> aught he had saved the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused. <clears throat> with me in charge, he told her, My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns is he has entrusted to my care. There is no one greater in the house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her, or even be with her. Now it happened one day, he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there inside. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. He left his garment in her hand, and fled, and went outside. And it came to pass, when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand, and was fled forth, that she, had, that she called unto the men of her house, and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought me in a Hebrew unto, uh, unto us to mock us. He hath came in, in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass, when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me, and fled, and got him out. And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. Then she told him this story, that Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make sport of me. And as I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. So Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, and place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in the jail. But the Lord was with Joseph, and extended kindness to him, and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. And the chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail, so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. All right. What's the meaning of this text? The meaning of this text is Joseph, because of his integrity, uh, wound up punished, but in a sense he also wound up blessed. I mean, that's a very, perhaps, uh, superficial meaning, but very quickly that's what it is. He was faithful and filled with integrity, but being accused wrongly, he still maintained his integrity, uh, even though it cost him, but even wound up then blessed because of the kindness of the jailer. Uh, the implications of this. this. This isn't just if a woman comes to you and entices you. If it's the other way around, it could be a 
man seeking to entice a woman. It could be somebody saying, hey, come on, juggle the books and you and I will split the money, you know, and we'll rip off the company. It could be something like that. It could be go ahead and, and uh, uh, you know, steal those, those tickets and you and I will go to the ball game and that poor sap will be, be out of luck, you know, or whatever. It, you know, conniving together to do something evil and then you refuse to do it and then you get fired from your job. Uh, or you get cut from the football team or, or something like that. It could be a variety of things. Now what's the significance? The implications are, well, I should remain faithful no matter what the cost is. Sometimes if I follow the Lord, it's going to cost me, but He'll bless me in the end. We should flee temptation. Sometimes being good brings hardship. All those kinds of things are the significance of this text. But the author doesn't say these things directly, does he? He doesn't say that what she is enticing him to do is wrong. How do we know it's wrong then? From other places in Scripture and also because the law of God is written on our hearts. But primarily when it comes to interpreting Scripture, we know that this is wrong because thou shalt not commit adultery. Right? And we understand that what, what she was trying to get him to do was evil. And we also know that from other places in Scripture, then no matter what the cost, we should remain firm in our faith and be obedient to the Lord. Be ye holy, for I am holy. So we infer these things from teachings elsewhere. Let's look at one that's a little bit shorter. Go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 to 26, and here's where we're going to stop. Okay. Matthew 15, 21 to 26. Who was the last one to read? Okay, uh, Jordan, would you pick up with that? Matthew 15, 21. Then Jesus went hence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Jesus appears to insult the woman, he calls her a dog. Not exactly an endearing comment, all right? What do we make of that? Jesus called her a dog. Now somebody, go, look at that, you know, you called Jesus a great savior, look what he did there. He called her a dog, how could I ever follow somebody who, you know, you say he's God and he's good and he's holy and he's true and he's never sinned, he calls this woman a dog, I can't follow him. Well, that's a bunch of nonsense. That's looking for an excuse not to believe because if you look at the entire scriptures, you find that what Jesus is doing is certainly something else than just simply insulting her. Jesus appears to insult her, but let's look at 11:28 through 30. Whose turn is it to read? Somebody look up Matthew 11:28 through 30. Somebody else look up John 6:37. Randy, you got one already. Go ahead. Which one is it? Uh, Matthew 11. Yeah, through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. All right then. So on the one hand, he calls this woman a dog, but in chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, Jesus says, hey, if you're weary and burdened, you come to me and I'll give you rest and, 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 and learn of me. My yoke is easy, my burden is light, and I'll embrace you and I'll love you and I'll help you. Now, how do we reconcile those two things? How about the John 6, 37? What does that say? John 6, 37. This is a verse that we should commit to memory. If anybody comes to me, I'll never cast them out. I'll never reject anybody. Even you, you dog. So what's going on here? 
Now note verses 27 to 28 of Matthew 15. Matthew 15, I'm not going to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now let's read verses 27 and 28. But she said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. In light of this, why did Jesus call the Syrophoenician woman a dog? Knowing what we know about Jesus from other places, what do you think he was doing? Testing. Yeah. Maybe he was trying to see how determined she was. How bad do you want it? Because Jesus told other parables. Remember the parable of the, of the persistent widow? You know, she goes and, and she says, you know, I want you to avenge me of my adversary. I'm getting ripped off and the guy doesn't want to do it because she's persistent. She keeps knocking and knocking and knocking at, at, at his heart. Not literally, because the other story is the one about the, the guy, well, if you're laying in bed at night and your friend comes over and he says, I've just got some guests that have come in. He's pounding on your door and he says, give me some bread because I need to feed these guests. And you tell him, go away. My family's in bed with me and we're all asleep. Go away. But he says, even though he's your friend, you won't help him. But because he won't shut up, <laughs> you'll help him. So persistence pays off. Jesus here is letting her prove his very point that persistence pays off. And this is one of those, because she's a Gentile woman, see? I mean, she's a Syrophoenician. She's not a Jew. But if you come to me, no matter who you are, I won't cast you out. So I think it's just a test of faith to see how determined and sincere she was. So that's what we have to understand from these texts. You know, you read a text, what then are we trying to learn from it? How do we learn from it? Now, that text does not say Jesus was testing to see how, how serious she was, but we infer it because we know that Jesus doesn't turn anybody away. So anyway, I think that's how we need to interpret that particular story anyway. The moral of the story is, is Jesus doesn't turn anybody away. And after all, he did help her, didn't he? He didn't say to her, I couldn't care less. You know, you're not even getting the crumbs either, you dog. That would have meant that. And you get out of here. I don't want anything to do with you. He doesn't do that. So I think you, you again, we infer meanings from texts because of what we're told elsewhere. Narratives don't always teach you directly what you're supposed to know. You're supposed to understand it from what we know of the scriptures in other places. So that's what I mean when I say narratives don't only teach directly. The moral of the story has to be inferred from what's taught propositionally elsewhere. We're going to go ahead and stop right there.